Okay, while we get started, let me tell you that uh, you don't seem excited to know anything about your colleagues. So I only got one proposition for tomorrow, so the thing is not going to happen. Uh, I hope that you will receive information about tomorrow's dinner, either today or tomorrow. It's usually around 8, and it's a hotel by Paulista. So if things don't change, that use it as a benchmark, then you will receive an, e receive an email with more information by Umberto. Uh, what I know is that we will cover the food, which is forever, like unstoppable, and you can eat as much as you want. And um, But you have to go get it, which is unusual in Aerojizio. So there is, a, there is a potential wall between you and the food. And uh, we will not pay alcoholic drinks and only one non-alcoholic drink. So all the rest you will have to pay for yourself, but it's okay, I guess. All right, so uh, yes. Just a second, let me do this. Okay, so now it should be working. And, uh, Oops. Okay, you're on. Yeah, I think so. OK, so let's continue where we left off yesterday. Uh, so just to recap, uh, we have discussed that even though neutrinos are quite, have quite few interactions, you know, as they go to the planet, uh, let me show you a previous slide where we left it off. As they go to the planet, they can still get attenuated. And I had shown to you that at the highest energies of like 100 PV, so the PV, the neutrino interaction length is going to be comparable to the diameter of the planet. And some people were, were sharp and realized that they could measure the Earth's density and mass uh, using high energy neutrinos. Uh, and that's where we left it off. Um, but that discussion was encompassed in a, in, a, in, a, in a bigger picture, which is to try to understand how to compute the number of expect a neutrino in a typical neutrino telescope. Um, and we had started with this uh, plot here. Um, just to remind you the, no, where did I left them? The point. Huh? Oh, there it is. In this cartoon here, uh, this blue region here is my instrumented uh, detector volume. Uh, and this is uh, the environment that surrounds it. It could be water, it could be uh, other ice or rock, but it's not instrumented. Uh, so as we discussed, when you have an electron type neutrino, the interaction is going to be only visible when the neutrino actually interacts inside of my detector. In the cases of muon neutrinos and tau neutrinos, it's more complicated because of the fact that the charge lepton that's produced of the neutrino interaction can range out. So we computed um, the tau neutrino, uh, a typical tau interaction length. And just to remind you of that, we figured out that if you have 100, 100 TV tau, typically that has an interaction length or a decay length, uh, let's call it lambda decay, of around five, five meters. Uh, so it's very, it's very short. Uh, just to remind you of the scales of detectors, we're talking about the spacing between strings in an ice cube detector is around 125 meters, and the separation between typical detectors is around, is around 50 meters. Oops. Okay. Uh, so that's this formula here. So the case of the tau is very analogous to the case of the electron in the end. Uh, what's more complicated is the case of the muon. Uh, and the reason is that the muon, uh, if we computed the, inter the decay length of the muon at a similar energy, like the 100 TVs, it was much larger. And the reason of that is that the muon lifetime compared to the tau lifetime is significantly longer. Uh, so then what happens in the, in the case of the muon is that, in mind, this is my, uh, this is my, my muon detector. So this is a, let's call this a, a, muon, a muon effective area. So that means that any muon that just crosses through this area, uh, I will absolutely with 100% certainty see. Um, so then what happens is that my neutrino can interact, let's say, anywhere within this volume here. 
So my neutrinos come in the line like that, and it has a muon interaction. That muon, as long as it makes it to my detector, it counts as having interacted, or is counted in the interactions that I see. Um, so we are trying to calculate basically what is this effective, uh, what's called neutrino detection volume. And for that, we need to get uh, the distance that the muon can travel. So uh, Johannes, yesterday I talked about muon energy losses and actually particle physics energy losses. And they're going to be energy de independent. Uh, so here you can see the way that the muon loses energy uh, as a function of the energy of the muon in ice. So basically, in the inner rays that we're talking about, here is 10 TeVs from this line here. Oh. Uh, the dominant error losses are given by these three color lines. And those are going to be dominated by three processes. Uh, basically, Bremsstrahlung, uh, this is the green one. Uh, pair production, uh, which is the black one. And then photonuclear effects, uh, which is shown here as this dash blue color. So photonuclear, in the case of the muon, is slightly smaller. Uh, pair production and Bremsstrahlung are the two dominant processes. So the muon energy loss, uh, per uh, column density uh, can be decomposed like that. So this is the ionization losses, that's the red line. Those are very much uh, negligible in the high energy range. Uh, this is the Bremsstrahlung per production and nuclear, photonuclear processes. And so what you can observe here is that the ionization loss approximately as a function of energy of one GeV is approximately constant. So the ionization loss is basically a constant that's to first order energy independent. On the other hand, the pair production, uh, brainstorms and photonuclear processes uh, approximately correlate with energy. So that means that we can rearrange our muon energy losses into the simplified form, uh, where the muon loss is just given by um, a constant term plus a co another, another coefficient times the energy. So it's going to be an important relationship, I'm just going to note here, that typically the average, this is the, the average mean energy loss is going to be equal to a coefficient plus B plus E. Uh, this is true uh, as long as we are above, let's say, one GB or so. Um, okay, so we have done studies in the eyes to see how uh, these parameters um, can be, or the value of these of this energy losses in, in the ice have been computed. And for example, for ice, we have that the A coefficient is typically around 0.2 in these units, and the B coefficient is around uh, 0.4 in these units. And I'm not sure what, if anybody knows what a meter water equivalent is. It's just a unit of column density. So uh, the column density uh, is going to be equal to the length times the density of the material. Right, so then if I have water uh, and I'm talking about one meter, so I have one meter times the density of water. So the density of water is one gram per cubic centimeter, right? And this is then equal to 100 grams per centimeter square, okay? And this is the definition of uh, one meter water equivalent. So when you see a unit, it just means that. So uh, using this formula, we can compute uh, the energy of, or the typical distance that a muon will travel. So for example, if I have a muon with an energy of, say, 10 TeVs, right? Uh, the typical column density of equal travel, uh, the final distance is going to be the natural log. And then you're going to have one plus uh, 10, but that's in GVs here. Uh, so that's 10 to the three uh, times the B coefficient, which is 0.3. The matter, matter, uh, what meter water equivalent cancels. Uh, so you're going to have that times 10 to the minus three. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm oh, sorry, this is the TV, so it's the uh, So that is, oops. Uh, I hope this is right, maybe. Okay, so it's into minus uh, three times 0.4. Mm -hmm. 
and then you have to divide by 20. Uh, and that is times, of course, uh, 1 over b, uh, and that's going to be 10 to the 3. Uh, I'm going to round up to that, that to be a point 0.2, so it's going to be uh, just uh, a factor of 2 here. Okay? Meters water equivalent. Uh, so basically, then, this is going to be uh, basically 1 plus 10 in log. So this is approximately the log of, let's say, uh, this is like 20 or so times 10 to the 3 times 2. Uh, so then this typical column density, now if you're talking about uh, in a medium like ice, we have water. That means that the typical length is going to be of order or kilometers. I'm here too lazy to calculate the log of 20. OK, so you can compute that. And you will see that if you tabulate that distance, you're going to get it here. So here is a function of that muon energy from here, uh, the distance that it will travel. And you, you see here uh, 10 to the 4, uh, which is this energy, uh, well, 10 to the, 10 to the 4 uh, GV, which is this energy here. Uh, you see that the typical muon distance is somewhere between a kilometer and, and 10 kilometers, so closer to 10. Uh, and this, uh, this actually then, uh, is, going to, is going to flatten. Um, for the case of the tau, uh, as we discussed earlier, this is, this is much smaller. Okay, so that means that a muon uh, that's produced outside of my detector is going to typically travel, uh, depending on the muon energy, between a kilometer or even up to uh, 100 kilometers. So it's quite a long distance. Okay, so the number of events in your typical detector can be uh, organized as follows. So it's going to be the effective neutrino area. So that's basically going to be the uh, combination of uh, the neutrino interaction and the muon ranging distance, which is this, multiplied by your neutrino flux. <laughs> so if you uh, plug in the numbers uh, for a neutrino that's of order of a TeV, you're going to have that the conversion probability, that is the product of the cross sections of the area, is going to be of order of 10 to the minus 6 times the energy of the neutrino in TeVs. Now, this formula here doesn't account for the fact that the neutrinos are going through the planet. Uh, so you need to put an extra factor, which is the survival probability. So the survival probability is just going to be a shadow factor we had in, in the previous lecture. So the probability of, let's say, new to mu conversion, so the product of these cross sections times this range here, the definition, uh, is shown here. And it's basically then the convolution of a growing neutrino cross section. Remember, the like, neutrino cross section is first linearly growing, and then it slows down, times the fact that the muon range has this uh, logarithmic dependence of energy. The product of these two things then results in two kind of slopes at the lower energy, so this is below a TeV. It grows roughly, this is all in units of TeVs, uh, like the power of the neutrino to the 2.2. And at the higher energies, it grows roughly like the power of the neutrino to the minus 2.8. Uh, so the number of neutrino events can be computed as the geometrical mu and effective area, so this area here multiply by your neutrino flux, which is given by this symbol here, times this conversion factor, which is account for the fact that the neutrino has to interact and the muon has to range out. Okay. So we can do this computation again at one TV, back of the envelope, the product of the cross-section times the muon range is basically 10 to the minus 6. Um, so if you take an Amanda detector or an Antares detector, that's going to be uh, a neutrino effective area of around order one meter. Uh, if you take ice cubes, so ice cubes, so geometrically speaking, is one square kilometer in each of the sides. So the geometrical area of ice cube uh, is just one, 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 um, one kilometer square. So if I take one kilometer square times 10 to the minus six, that's going to give me 100 meters square. Uh, so that means that uh, the ice cube neutrino observatory, when you actually take into account that the neutrino cross-section 
is of course very small, uh, is equivalent to a 10 meter uh, gamma ray telescope. Okay. And uh, telescopes of these sizes actually uh, appear in gamma ray observatories much, much earlier. So one of the first sort of first meter uh, gamma ray telescope that will be equivalent sized uh, compared to the current ice cube detector uh, was already operational or built in the, 19, in, the late, in the late 60s. So that can give you a sense of the fact that why neutrino physics and neutrino astrophysics is, is in such a, let's say, early stage compared to gamma rays, whereas the gamma ray experiments are now in their basically third generation experiments. Here, the Wimpel telescope, the Emberitas, and OCTA. The neutrino detectors are now at the stage of the first gamma ray experiments in the 70s. And the reason for that is just because of this cross section here happens to be very small. Okay, so the neutrino effective area uh, is again that product of this conversion factor uh, to produce a muon, oops, a muon and a neutrino, what are we doing here? A muon and a neutrino um, times the muon effective area here. And basically, you can compute the expected number of events. Is going to be equal to your time of exposure, given say in years, your observation solid angle, like that, and then the integral in energy of the neutrino effective area times the neutrino flux. So if I take, um, for example, an E to the minus two flux, I can plug out this normalization here um, and, and use an effective area as quoted, and you can obtain the total rate of certain neutrinos in a given detector. So this quantity is very helpful because that means if you're a theorist, you can just put your favorite astrophysical neutrino model, multiply by this uh, effective area, and that will give you a total number of observed events. So you can see that here for uh, typical ice cube effective areas as a function of the neutrino energy. So uh, they are going to be different for different flavors. And the reason is that only for the case of the muon flavor, you have this ranging effect. Their flavors do not have this ranging, ranging functionality. So in dash lines here, you can see the effective area of ice cube for um, a northern sky track. So that's basically new muse. So that's in here. And you can see that, as advertised, at 100 TeV, that roughly corresponds to uh, 100 meters square. Uh, so basically, this means that Ice Cube is a very efficient muon detector. It's almost 100% efficient muon detector, because this number you can just compute uh, given the neutrino cross-sections and just the muon ranging. Um, the, neutrino, uh, the effective area is going to grow. And this grow is, again, dominated or just controlled by the fact that the neutrino cross section is growing and the muon range is also growing. The other flavors here have smaller effective areas. As I was saying yesterday in the discussion session, basically the effective area of a mu E flavor is a factor of around 10 smaller than the effective area of a muon neutrino. And the reason is that, again, they do not have this ranging effect here. You can see, though, that the new E effective area does supersede the mu neutrino effective area at the glass resonance, where the neutrino cross-section grows significantly. Okay. So yesterday in the discussion session, also somebody asked a question that was given an astrophysical neutrino flux of equal flavor, um, which of the flavors does I skip see more? So the answer is then given by this plot. So the, the flavor that you actually will see more interactions is always going to be the mu neutrino flavors. The other flavors are going to have a factor of 10 less interactions. But this question is a little tricky because one thing is how many neutrinos interact in the detector. And another question is of those neutrinos that interact in the detector, how many of them can I tell you that was an astrophysical neutrino? So the second question is probably more relevant, and actually that would require us understanding the backgrounds uh, that dominate the neutrino searches. Okay, so in some sense, the only thing that this tells you is, is just your total rate. So to understand um, 
how we can control the backgrounds of a neutrino experiment, we need to understand how we can reconstruct the different neutrino events. So we're going to do that now. So um, as you know now, uh, when you have a charged particle that's going faster than the speed of light in a medium, it's going to make this shrink of uh, emission. And the shrink of emission uh, is going to make this uh, hyperbolic light should I put on here. Um, in the case of ice, uh, well, this is the formula for the shrink of angle. Depends on the speed of the particle, but you can assume it's relativistic. It's a muon, and this is a 100 TV muon, so this is a very good approximation. Uh, the uh, refraction index of the ice is around 1.3. And so then you can compute the Cherenkov of angle and something around 41 degrees. Um, so I think Johannes covered this very nicely, but this is a very, very well known phenomena. You can see it in planes, you can see it in ducks, and you can see it also in the ice cube level. So this is supposed to represent the Cherenkov of angle. Uh, so let me show you how that actually looks uh, in, the, in the ice. Oops, it is. Hopefully it works. Mm -hmm. So here you want to see a muon, and the muon is going to traverse the ice, and the blue balloons is going to be Sharenko front that's going to be emitted by the muon. Um, in this picture, uh, also it's also shown uh, the detectors of the light as the muon is going through the detector. So you can see it quite nicely. Um, but of course, you know the the sensors are are basically tracking that channel that of emission. It's going to be a little more complicated, and I will explain you why in some minutes. OK. Mm -hmm. So if we will be in a very, um, uh, in an environment that does not scatter light significantly, we'll be actually able to use the fact that if you have a muon, that muon has a Cherenkov front, which is this shape here. So I could use my detectors, so one of these purple points, to actually reconstruct exactly the muon direction. Uh, this is a technique called using direct photons. So that means that you want to look for photons that, given a trajectory, arrive exactly at the, at the correct time as a predicted sharing of light. In practice, uh, in ice cube at least, this is only possible for very low energy uh, events that are very close to the detector. For high energy events, it's not going to be possible. Uh, in water detectors, this technique actually is going, is going to work much better. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is that as the energy of the muon increases, these processes here uh, start to dominate. And photonuclear processes, uh, they're going to be able to produce catastrophic energy losses. So there's going to basically, the muon, instead of losing energy nicely, is going to lose energy by chunks. And these chunks are going to introduce uh, hadronic showers. And these hadronic showers themselves are going to produce other charged particles. So one moment I have my muons going along, now it has a photohadronic emission, now I have my muon and a bunch of pions around it. Those pions may be charged, and they have their own sharing of rings. So now it's not as simple as having a single muon with a very well-defined sharing of emission, but basically a collection of them. So this is exemplifying these two plots here that goes from this very nice discussion by B. Bush in 95. You can see here that if I have a muon, uh, let's say, at um, 1 TeV, if that muon goes to a small piece of material, in this case 50 meters, the energy of the muon is going to be very broad. And the reason is that these stochastic processes, this production of pi and so, are very, are, are very much a random process. Um, and so then if the muon, of course, goes to a larger distance, the final you know, muon energy is, is, is extremely broad. Mm -hmm. So at a low energy, this is again from the same author. So for some reason, this person decided to draw this cartoon next to his diagrams. Uh, but this gives you a sense of scale. This is supposed to be a person, I, I guess. So this is 10 centimeters. This is a meter here. So you have a low energy. Um, track, the photohydronic emission is not very large. So you see it very nicely, um, just a muon branching out. So in this case, the muon, the expected sharing of cone that you will see is very well defined. Only sometimes you see these things coming out, which are eventual photohydronic processes. Now, when the energy increases, all the cross-section increases. So now, per distance travels, 
you have more chances of having a photohydronic emission. So here is the zoom out version, the zoom in version. And you can see now that you start having this with the hairs that pop up. So this is, for example, pions being produced and so on and so forth. So these uh, additional charged particles are going to store your ideal sharing of cone produced by your muon. Now, as the energy increases furthermore at, at 10 TV, then you can see now that this starts becoming very severe. There are lots of photohydronic interactions, little, little hydronic showers, and now you have a kind of a mess. So these high energies, you know, you don't expect to see a very sharp sharing of cone because you're seeing some superpositions of many sharing of cones that are going in kind of random directions. Okay. So that's complication number one. So the, the idea that you can just use the sharing of cone is does work at the lower energies, less so at the higher energies. And another complication is something that, well, people understood, let's say, since, since the early days, is that, of course, the ice uh, has a given absorption and attenuation length that's going to be depth dependent. And so the absorption length in the ice is, is very large. So you can see here it's orders of hundreds of meters. That means a typical photon will be able to travel uh, at least that distance on average. Uh, but one thing that's smaller in ice is the scattering length. So the scattering length here is of order 20 or 30 meters. That means that before the photon gets absorbed, it probably has one or two interactions that deviate the photon trajectory. Okay. So let me show you how that actually looks in simulation. So here you're going to see a high energy muon. Uh, and each of these little hairs that you see here is one photon. Okay? So this one is a, happens to be a TV energy one. Let me show you to that again. Kind of fast. Again, in all of these figures, of course, the, the color is just a tiny. So what you're seeing here is a combination of two effects, right? One effect is that it's a high energy event. So it has lots of stochastic processes. Stochastic processes, some of them are photohydronic, but also little showers. Showers by themselves already branch out uh, the, the particles. And on top of that, you see also that there is what we call diffusion, right? So the photons are scattering around and going in all directions. Now, if you were to see the same or similar event but not in ice, but in water. When in water, the, up, the scattering length is longer than ice, you will see a totally different picture. So this is now a uh, neon now scattering in water. And you can see that in this case, uh, most of the photons go in straight lines. You still have the problem that your shrink of cones may not be well defined because of the secondary charged particles that are produced in, by the muon itself. But at least the direct photons uh, are better. OK. And so this is one of the reasons why water and ice detectors are complementary detectors. In, a, in an ice detector, the absorption length is longer than in a water detector. That means that I can space out my sensors farther away than in a water detector. On the other hand, and that means that my effective area will be bigger for the same money. Uh, for the case of uh, uh, a water experiment, uh, the uh, interaction length, or scattering length is going, to be, is going to be longer. That means I'm going to have more direct light. That means that now my photons actually point of the direction where the light was emitted. And what that causes here, it can be seen here. So here's a function of the uh, neutrino energy. You can see the expected resolution. So this is size cube in some configurations. So this is the latest, let's say, one of the latest configurations. And you can see the Antares angular resolution. So even though Antares is much smaller, because it has more direct light, it can actually reconstruct on average the muon tracks better than the ice cube. And so in this other plot here, you can see how far away we are from the actual physical limit of the reconstruction. Because of course, you know, unlike uh, gamma ray astronomy, where you actually are really reconstructing the gamma ray direction, here we are not really reconstructed the neutrino direction, we are reconstructed the muon direction, right? So there's always going to be some offset between the muon and the neutrino. And on average, the, oops, maybe, no, okay. On average, the deviation angle between a muon and a neutrino is given by this equation here. So it's about one degree at the TV. 
So that is a fundamental limitation of neutrino astronomy. Luckily, the region where we actually are able to uh, easily find out the astrophysical neutrinos is going to be in the high energy range. And in the high energy range, this fundamental limitation between the neutrino and the muon angle is still much smaller than the current resolution we can achieve. Now, that's with respect to the direction. What about the end resolution? Well, the end resolution is going to be tricky. Uh, part of the reason is that as the energy is high, we are in this highly stochastic regime. And that means that you know, there is going to be, for the same given mu energy, a, a very large distribution of possible energy losses. But the good thing about being in this radioactive regime uh, is that there is a correlation between the uh, muon energy losses and the momentum of the muon. And so what we do is basically we have an event like so. We see that it had some losses. Uh, and we try to basically measure the DEDX along this track trajectory. And that gives us an idea of the uh, energy that this muon had. But this is very, is very, is very broad. So here I show you the typical resolution that you can get in uh, this kind of detectors, function of the muon energy. So here is the muon energy in GEVs. Uh, so notice that the Y scale, the resolution is given in uh, sigmas per log of 10. So that means that you know, it's an order one number that you actually get, so not the best. Um, this actually only works in the high energy regime. And the reason is that uh, as the energy of the neutrino, as the energy of the muon goes down, let's say below a TV, uh, the muon no longer starts being dominated by stochastic processes, and the energy losses tend to be constant as a function of the muon energy. Okay. So that's um, about tracks. Uh, what happens about the other interactions? So what happens about the cases when you have a new E or a new tau making a shower? So uh, electromagnetic cascades, um, are going to be also energy independent. Uh, the length of it is, look at the scale here, this is a meter. So basically, as a function of from 10 GB, 100 GB, or in 1 TV, the size of the cascade is, is relatively small uh, compared to our detector size. So again, this is one meter compared to distance of over 100 meters. Uh, but one thing that's, that's relevant is that the number of particles that is produced by an electromagnetic cascade increases significantly as you increase the energy of the, of the primary. And I like how at least this author managed to formulate that in his, in his work. So he says here that the pictures are postscript graphics, which sizes increases as from 87, 85 kilobytes to four kilobytes. So you know, in a postscript graphic, you of course save each of the trajectories. Just telling you that you know, the size of the images just scales with the number of particles. It's kind of cute. Okay. So the um, summary is that the electromagnetic cascades are going to be relatively small uh, compared to typically detector sizes, and their energies are going to be correlated with the number of secondaries produced. There's going to be a difference between electromagnetic and hadronic cascades, and I think uh, Johannes is going to talk about that more, more sensibly, but I just wanted to give you how that looks in a transverse plane. So for an electromagnetic cascades, those are going to be much more, uh, let's say, collinear, a hadronic cascades are going to be much more spread out. But again, in the case of ice cube, uh, because of the spacing uh, that we have between our detectors, it's going to be very hard for us to distinguish between this case and this case. This is order one meter again. So typical detector sizes are at least 10 times in the closest areas, around 10 times larger than this scale here. So in the case of ice cube and similar detectors, uh, we have basically very hard, it's very hard for us to distinguish between an electromagnetic and cascades. And thus, we basically only operate in two topologies. We say that there was a track, so a giant line, and that looks like a muon, or there was a, or there was a blob. Okay. So in the case of the cascades, we can still do some kind of, some kind of reconstruction on them. And let me show you how one cascade looks. So here is a cascade. So you can see that, remember that the color indicates time. Uh, so the bluer are later times and the red are earlier times. So you saw at one moment that the color of the cascade was asymmetric. That means that some of the photons reach one side earlier than the others. Let me show you that again. Mm -hmm. 
So there's going to be a slight time difference in the arrival times between one side of the sensors and the other side of the sensors. And we can use that slight time difference between the arrival times to try to determine the direction of the cascade. Um, now let's see if this works because this one has been a little, a little naughty. So this is how we look in water. And again, you see it looks quite different uh, because again in water, your scattering length is much, is much longer, so the photons tend to go more straight directions. Okay. So this is an example of an ice cube real event. Uh, uh, it's one of the original uh, first PV events. Um, and you can see here the event itself, so the interaction point was somewhere in, over here. And each of these little panels shows you the observed charge as a function of time uh, in each of the domes that were close to the event. Um, and there are two lines shown here uh, just for illustration. One is uh, this blue line and one is this red line. So the blue line is when you make the simulation such that it's actually going in the correct direction that the neutrino came from. Uh, the red line is here just to illustrate of what happens if I make the simulation go in the opposite direction that the event actually came from. And you can see that you, know, you just get the time dependence totally incorrect in many of your photosensors. Um, so that is how we actually are able to reconstruct our cascades. Basically, we looked at the domes around them and then to look for these tiny uh, tiniest, um, time differences. And so with this, uh, we managed to get a, re a resolution of order uh, 10 degrees, uh, let's say at 100 PV. And so this actually is a very complicated problem because the uh, ice in the Antarctic is not entirely, not only is it not uniform in depth, but also it's actually been modified by us as we drill the holes in the ice. Um, so let me just show you this briefly. But this is a, I'm going to go through a couple of seconds of this. It's kind of a lengthy video. So this is one of the, uh, cameras that was installed uh, during the deployment of Amanda. These guys are very happy. Um, and um, this camera here was put in so we can see how the ice refreezes um, once, the, once the domes are in place. So here, I'm just going to move it faster in time in a minute, but here is where they're actually putting, oh, saying goodbye. <laughs> So it has two views, so it has this view that's looking at the dome just below it, and it has another view that's going to look basically upwards. And so here is where they start deploying the, this is the upward view, uh, the, the camera that's you know, basically connected between the domes uh, into the hole. Um, so it's the, they're going to go there slowly. So this is actually kind of a lengthy video, so I'm going to, I'm going to skip it, but you can, you can watch it later. Yeah, they, they went. Where is it? So as, as time passes, uh, now you can still see this is for several hours or days. Let me see. Uh, if you can see this region here, it's a little it's a little clearer. We have this darker region here. So these darker regions here are actually like the walls of the of the hole. It's been untouched. Untouched ice. Uh, these regions in the center. It's a region where uh, the ice has been perturbed and it's refreezing. Uh, and you're going to see in a minute probably, you see that there are like, things moving up. So these are air bubbles that are produced uh, when the drilling process happens itself. And these air bubbles, some of them are going to go up, but some of them are going to get captured in the ice. And when the air bubbles get captured in the ice, they will increase the scattering length. Uh, it was a weird hunt. Um, they're going to get captured in the ice and produce more scattering. Okay. So uh, there are going to be problems related to the local effects of the ice. Uh, this is, again, the picture of the same uh, similar camera. So here, you see the part has been drilled. So you see this bubble region. And this is actually untouched ice. So in SQ, one of the challenges is, of course, to model this uh, whole ice column here. 
And the reason this is important is because typically, uh, if you have, for example, a photon that's going this direction, if it enters the whole ice column, uh, it can backscatter like that. So that means it changes your expected light yield in this detector, or it can also do the opposite in another detector. Another thing that needs to be modeled uh, and is currently under development is trying to model not only uh, the whole ice columns, but also the, uh, the actual cable, uh, cable positions. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna skip this. Okay. Okay, so that's all I want to say about reconstruction. So the next thing we should talk about is uh, the atmospheric neutrino background, which is quite, it's quite a problem. How am I doing it? Yeah, this thing. Oh, because of the video. Okay, so if we were to look at 10 milliseconds of ice cube data, uh, you will see something like that. So these are all muons, most of them are coming up. And so the, what we need to do is somehow within all of this mess, we need to find uh, one astrophysical neutrino. So to give you a sense of scale, uh, ice cubes is about 100 billion uh, muon neutrinos per year. This is, uh, by the way, 10 to the 9 times 100. Uh, then it sees about 1 million atmospheric neutrinos uh, also per year. And then, you know, every time, every 1 billion events that we actually observe, one of those is going to be an astrophysical neutrino. So the task that we have ahead of us is trying to figure out how to get rid of these guys, get rid of these guys, and find these guys here. Okay. So, um, Johannes talked in the morning about the fact that, of course, there's a cosmic ray spectrum that's been measured via different experiments. So here's a cosmic ray spectrum as a function of energy. Uh, in the other range that we care about, you can see that the cosmic ray spectrum is approximately described by a power law. Uh, this power law has a slope of around e to the minus 2.75. Later in the high energy range, the, the spectrum gets more complicated, but I will show you that in, in the case of a cube, the relevant energy ranges for most of the neutrinos go up to around, let's say, 10 to 7. So what are atmospheric neutrinos? Uh, you typically have a cosmic ray that can be a proton or a heavy nuclei. That's going to start an atmospheric shower. Uh, and that shower is going to produce hydrons, electrons, and photons. Uh, the hydrons have some chance of decaying, so you produce a pion. Uh, and that pion, uh, when it decays, will make a muon. Uh, and of course, it will also make a neutrino. So the muons will reach to us. We already saw that you know, if you have a high energy muon, this has a very high probability of actually penetrating down several kilometers in the ice. Um, the neutrinos, of course, you know, since they're coming down, there is no longer any air shielding, so you, know, you, you will definitely see them. Uh, astrophysical neutrinos, of course, are expected to come by, them, by themselves. So yesterday during the discussion session, somebody asked a question about muon deflection, and I want to make some propaganda here. Uh, so this is the Cosmic Watch project. Um, which is a project that um, is designed so that people can build their own cosmic ray detectors at home, um, or as home, or as locally as possible. Um, and so there is a website if you guys go to Cosmic Watch or just ask me later, I can send you the information. But basically, you go to this website and you order the pieces and you assemble it yourself. And so how the Cosmic Watch detector works? It's a very simple detector. It's a plastic scintillator like that. Uh, and it has a photo detector, it uses a silicon photomultiplier. Uh, and the silicon photomultiplier is, is going to be basically your, your, your little PMT you want to have here. Uh, and then it uses an Arduino uh, to data processing using the signal that acquires from the silicon photomultiplier. So you can see, for example, here is the peak of one of the, of the particles. And uh, we have built our own electronics, so you can actually store this data and use it yourself. Uh, so with this kind of detectors, uh, well, uh, you can measure basically muons and gamma rays. Uh, just so you remind yourself that you know if you have an alpha and beta easily block with paper or aluminum, uh, gammas are more stuff. So this this little detector uh, in its normal state is just covered by an aluminum aluminum box. Uh, but the nice thing about them is that you can build two of the, of the detectors or three or four, and then connect them in in a synchronous mode. And when they're connected in a synchronous mode, you can have them so that they trigger when they're in conscience to reach each other. And what that allows you is that since each of these has a little plastic scintillator built on them, 
uh, you can figure out that, that really it was immune that went through it because it went through several of these detectors. Uh, so one of our students has been traveling quite a lot. So he took these detectors on the planes and started making measurements at different altitudes and different locations. So here is the number of counts he got in this, one of these detector configurations uh, as a function of different places he went. Um, so you can see that, for example, at the South Pole, which is pretty high, uh, you get a, lot, a very large rate. So this is nice. Uh, so yeah, if you're interested in this, talk to me later and, and we'll try to, to connect you. So buffering neutrinos are basically then produced in what we call two components. There's going to be the conventional component and the prone component. So the conventional component is very, much better understood. The prone component is less understood. Uh, the conventional component is all neutrinos that basically come from the decay of pions and kaons. Um, so when, a, when you produce a pion, um, it typically is going to decay 99.9% of the times into a pion plus a million and a mu. Uh, I'm not sure if you have done this exercise, but you know, of course a pion can do this, but the pion can also do this, right? So naively, you will think that you know, the, the electron mass right, is 0 0.5 MeVs, and the muon mass is around 105 MeVs. The pion mass is around 140 MeVs. Right? And so you will think that the pion, when it's produced, it would really like to do this, because this guy is much higher, well, the neutrino is effectively massless. Uh, it would like to do this. Um, but for some reason, you see the pion, its main decay channel is going to be into a mu plus an mu with almost 100% alteration. Um, so the reason for this is, 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 of course, well known. And it has to do with the fact that there's a helicity suppression factor in this channel. So if you, um, I invite you to, to think about this if you have not seen this or, or thought about this question in the past. Uh, so basically, mu neutrinos are going to be predominantly produced by pions at lower energies, and then at higher energies, they're going to be produced by chaos. Uh, new is, uh, because of this suppression, are going to come basically only from uh, chaos. There is also something that we call the prompt component, and uh, I will explain you why they're called prompt component in a minute. But the prompt component is basically produced by uh, neutrinos that come from D mesons, uh, and these are became modes like this. Okay. So how do we model the uh, mechanism of production of atmospheric neutrino shower? It's basically, again, one of these cascade equations we have seen earlier for the neutrino case. And basically, you have to compute for each of your uh, hydron species, which is called here level H, you have a probability that that species uh, at a given energy and at a given height uh, interacts in the air or it may be the case. Uh, it can also radiate energy continuously, so it's not catastrophic. And basically, the species themselves get feedback uh, terms from other interactions, so that means that the same species just loses energy at a given higher height and contributes to a lower height, or also can um, get increased by the fact that uh, other species decay into this species. So for example, in this differential equation, you initially would have uh, no term that comes from the neutrinos, so there will be no neutrinos, but the neutrino, uh, the neutrino population will be increased as they come from terms that, for example, come from uh, pion decays and things like this. Uh, so these kind of cascade equations um, can be efficiently solved uh, by converting these equations into matrix equations. Um, so this, the uncertainties, once you solve these equations, the uncertainties on the atmospheric neutrino fluxes that are solved on these equations basically comes from three components. One is the initial parent cosmic ray flux, which is this piece here. The other thing is the fact that this shower is developing in the high atmosphere, uh, and so you need to know the density of the atmosphere at each, at each level. That's, that comes from here. And so the, uh, the cosmic ray measurements, basically, this information uh, comes from experiments like Johannes was talking to you early in the morning. 
Uh, the atmospheric density of the planet is actually measured and monitored by satellites. Uh, so we actually know the atmospheric density at each point in the sky, at each basically month or so. And then the other thing you need to know is you need to know particle physics. Now you need to know basically uh, how these reactions go and what is the energy a distribution that you expect of each of these decays. Okay. Um, so here, it's, um, you show the, it's shown the decay length uh, of a given species. In this case, there are going to be four things that we're going to care about, so pions, chaos, these, and etas. Uh, and here is the interaction length, for example, of chaos. Um, and what's important here is to notice that, again, as in the case of neutrinos and muons, there's going to be always a competition between the decay length and the interaction length. So when the, for example, if you have a 10 to the 4 k on, uh, the decay length uh, is much smaller than the interaction length. That means that a 10 to the 4 k on will typically just decay and make neutrinos. Uh, whereas at the same energies, the same k on will, uh, sorry, at higher energies, uh, eventually the interaction length will be such that the decay length will be longer and the k on will, will interact. So it depends, uh, basically, as a function of energy, when the crossings of these lines you will switch between interaction with the mesons and the, and the decay of the mesons. So in the end, um, the different neutrinos that you're going to observe of Earth are going to have some chance of some probability distribution are coming from, from some given parent. So here I show you the parent cosmic ray particle that produces a given of neutrino. So if I'm thinking about, for example, uh, let's say a 1 TV a uh, new mu, so that's this color and that solid line, that typically is being produced by a cosmic ray shower whose primary energy was somewhere around 10 to, 10 to the 4. Um, and this, this goes along with the statement I was saying earlier that in the case of ice cube, for typical neutrino energies that we care about, uh, you see at the highest, let's say 10 PEVs, this is like here, we don't see them neutrinos at these energies, we see them neutrinos up to, let's say, 100 PV, so somewhere between this gray and this orange. So the neutrinos that we observe are being produced by cosmic rays that are of energies less than 10 to the 7 GeVs. Okay. So here is uh, how the different uh, components of the atmospheric neutrino flux depend as a function of energy. Um, you can actually go ahead and compute this yourself via this publicly available code called MCEQ by Anatoly Fedinich. Uh, so here you can see the total, the total flux of, mion, of mions the total flux of mu neutrinos. Uh, so the muons are going to be dominated basically exclusively by pion decay. And it happens, and the reason of that, of that is that in this decay channel, in this decay process, when a pion decays into a muon, typically the muon is going to get most of the energy of the pion just because of the, of the, of the, of the fact that the muon mass is very close to the pion mass. Uh, in the case of the neutrino, the neutrino is going to get the smaller side of the energy in this interaction. So the pion contributions of the neutrino flux is going to be smaller. And actually, in the regime of tens of TeVs, most of the new mu's are going to come basically exclusively from K-on channels. Uh, in the case of the new E's, uh, the new E's are going to be a combination of k here. And at the highest energies, uh, this uh, d meson production. Um, one thing that's important is that uh, at the moment, we have measured uh, quite well the atmospheric neutrino flux uh, from mu neutrinos and also from electron neutrinos that comes from pions and chaos. Uh, but the atmospheric neutrinos that actually come from D mesons uh, and high, or higher mass mesons have not been observed. So the conventional component of atmospheric neutrinos uh, that's produced by pions and chaos is well understood. And it has typically an spectral index, so yes, in, well, in the end range that, that matters for I, for us, the cosmic ray spectral index is going to be approximately e to the minus 2.7. Uh, the conventional, the conventional uh, neutrino spectral index is going to be approximately e to the minus 3.7. And the reason is that for the conventional component, the, uh, at these energies, the pions and the kaons are going to prefer to interact rather than decay. Uh, so for high energies, uh, the interaction length uh, in, the, in the air uh, of the kaon is going to be actually smaller than its decay length. 
And when this condition is satisfied, uh, you're going to have that basically you're going to lose your high energy component of your flux and it's going to go down to higher energies. Uh, for the case of uh, the prompt component, at, ha at the energies that we're talking about, so we're talking about TV energies. For the case of the prompt component, the interaction length of a D is still uh, larger than the decay length of a D meson. And that means that, you know, in the case of a, of a, of a pion, you're going to have that the pion is produced here, and it would typically like to interact and become a lower energy particles. In the case of the D meson, if a D is produced, it will immediately just decay and make neutrinos. So that means that the D actually does not lose energy once it's produced in the atmosphere, whereas the pions and kaons at these energies do lose energy. Uh, for this reason, basically the prompt component, which is the, the, produced by these heavier particles, actually is going to follow uh, the, um, the cosmic ray spectrum. So the prompt, the prompt uh, flux is going to scale also like this, as the same as the cosmic rays, basically. Um, and another thing that's important is that uh, the conventional component, if you go back to that picture, the conventional component, if you see these units here, uh, has a very large contribution of new mu's. Uh, so, the, so the new mu flux is going to be much larger than the, than the new mu flux. Oops. See that? Oops. No. So you see pointer. So you see 10 to the minus 3 is here. So this flux here is at the order of 10 to the minus 1 or 2. So you look at the new E flux, it's at the order of 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 2. So the flux of the flux of mu neutrinos is going to be larger than the flux of electron neutrinos. And actually that's going to be relevant because when we're going to talk about differentiating uh, what is an astrophysical neutrino versus atmospheric neutrinos, if I see a cascade, I know it's not a muon, and I already know that my background size is already smaller by around a factor of 10 or so. Okay, uh, another take home measure of this is with respect to the fact of the angular distribution. So the prompt component, so that's produced by the heavier mesons. These mesons, when they're produced, they basically produce and decay instantaneously. And that means that uh, they do not experience any atmospheric effect. Uh, so the picture here will be like you have a cosmic ray, comes in, this is a proton, it has an interaction, makes a little shower, immediately the these produce, and immediately this makes a neutrino. So basically, the angular distribution that I expect for my neutrinos is going to trace the D meson production distribution, which is itself going to trace the protons. And the cosmic ray spectrum at these energies is very isotropic. That means that the cosmic ray spectrum looks very similar at different angles. So if I plot as a function of the, this is my planet, this is my, my little angle here. If I plot as a function of this angle, the flux of, so this is zero, this is pi half, this is pi. If I plot my uh, expected neutrino flux from these mesos that decay instantaneously, that's actually going to be roughly just a flat line here. On the other hand, um, neutrinos that are produced by pions and kaon decays are going to have a dependence on the amount of atmospheric uh, layers that they cross. So it so happens that the decay is actually easier when they cross uh, horizontal atmospheres because they see, let's say if you're going through the atmosphere, if you're going vertically, you see a very steeply rising profile of increasing density. When you go on, a, on an angle, you see the density growing slowly and slowly. And that means that there is a, late, a greater chance uh, for these mesons to decay. So when you look at the conventional component, the conventional component is actually going to look like this. Um, so that's, that's also very important because uh, the astrophysical component, of course, this is the prompt component. This is the conventional component. So the astrophysical component, if we assume, well, by assumption, we're going to assume it's isotropic, so it's going to be like that. So, if I want to figure out the size of my astrophysical component, the conventional component in angle, so with respect to this direction, 
is going to be very different than the superficial component. On the other hand, this from component is going to have the same angular dependence. So that means that unless I configure something else, uh, I better know exactly how big this guy is because if my superficial component will be of the same, say, spectral index, or so same e to the minus 2.7, there will be degenerate components. Um, and this is actually a big problem. And the reason this is a big problem is that in, in laboratories, we actually have not accurately measured uh, the production rate of, for example, proton plus air makes D, or proton plus carbon makes D. In the kinematic region, uh, what is continuous are produced is not well, well, well measured. And because this is QCD physics, you cannot compute this. So there's very large uncertainties in the normalization factor that compasses prone components. So the theoretical uncertainty of the prone component normalization can be a factor of order 10. Okay. There is also a similar uncertainty, of course, to some extent from the K on for the conventional component, but the conventional component we have measured. So we measure it for lower energies, so we know its size. And also the conventional component has a very soft spectrum, so it dies pretty fast, and it has a very different angular dependence. So it's less of a problem. Okay. So just to give you uh, an idea of the size of this, um, this is for, I think, one year of data, but this is the uh, angular dependence. So you can see that the atmospheric neutrinos of little peak here, kind of flat. The atmospheric muons are a lot. They're these guys here. Uh, so you know, one of the first things you want to do then, uh, and we'll talk about it in a minute, is you want to try to look at, uh, at this region of the sky, which is going to the planet. Because this atmospheric muon background is just a factor of, of a million larger than the atmospheric neutrino flux. Um, so we're going to have, so the, the, classic, the classic idea of how to look for astrophysical neutrinos is that, well, we should just look to the core and try to disentangle, basically, the three components, which is the conventional component, the prone component, astrophysical component, and we can disentangle them by their different uh, energy dependencies. Okay. So now with that, um, let me see if I have time. Okay, good. We have 30 minutes. We can probably make it, so that's good. Um, so there's going to be a two-prone assault in trying to figure out the astrophysical component. Um, so the first is, um, again, we have these two problems. One problem is that superficial neutrino flux is very small. We knew that from slide one. And the other problem is this backgrounds are very large. This one is gigantic, and this one is still very sizable. <laughs> the good news is that uh, we have measured the neutrino energy, the, the atmospheric neutrino flux as a function of energy. So here is shown as a function of the neutrino energy, the unfolded neutrino fluxes. So this is the unfolded mu e flux, and this is the unfolded mu mu flux. Uh, so these fluxes are under control. So I know more or less their sizes, and I know more or less how to extrapolate them down. So I know how, to, how this slope keeps going. Again, for the conventional component, it should just be roughly like that. Uh, for the prone component, it's here. You see the prone has this band of pink. It's because we, we're not sure how big this is. Uh, you can also see already in this plot, what I was telling you here is that this conventional component is falling down very fast. This prompt is, is much harder. Okay. Um, okay, so I said this. So strategy number one is, let's say, the idea that was conceived since the Dumont times. And the idea of Dumont is very simple, uh, and it's was also what we did in, in Amanda, is you just forget about all of the events that come from this part of the sky, so from the southern sky. And by doing that, you basically already eliminate all of the atmospheric muons that you have. So you only need to care about the atmospheric neutrinos. And so we did that with two years of data. So here are two years of data. Um, so here is the muon energy that we observed in our detector. Here is the events that were observed. And so you see that the data, this one is as, as little dots here. Uh, the conventional component, the red one here, is being fitted to the data. 
and, it's, and as, as you feed it and, uh, and you know how to extrapolate this energy dependence, it sets the line to this red line here. Okay? Um, and then you see that at high energies, uh, we observe, and this was back in 2012, uh, you see that there are these events that stick out uh, and, look, and look, uh, look harder. You could think that, well, maybe what's going on is that these events are not actually coming from the conventional component, but maybe they're produced by these D mesons that have these weird decays. But here is also shown the expected prompt shape. Yeah. So you see that the prompt contribution doesn't have the right shape to really match this one here. So what we did is basically we fitted uh, at the same time three components. So you fit one conventional component, uh, one prone component, and one uh, astrophysical component. And when we fit astrophysical component, we typically assume that the astrophysical component is going to have two important parameters. It's going to have some normalization, which I'm going to let it float, and it's going to have some power law index. Okay. So the results are typically shown in, this, in these two parameters. Um, okay, so as you can guess from, from, this, from the fact that this is a harder component than these two, this spectrum must be a harder at least than 2.7, because if not, it will have the same slope as the problem. Um, so we did this exercise now with many years of data. So we did that with eight years of data, and you can see that the difference configuration of ice cube is a function of time, and you can see that you know, in every single year, as you do this exercise, in the high energy tail, you observe this excess of event. And so this excess of events is recognized to be uh, the appearance of a new component, and the component is a astrophysical component. So you can try to fit um, the normalization of this component and its spectral index. And in the case of the immune data, that's actually very well described by a power law, uh, which uh, extends from 100 TB and, and higher energies. And the power law spectral index is 2.2. Okay, so from the... Um, True go immunes, I'm just going to call it gamma true go immunes. The spectral index is roughly 2.2. Um, and um, it's actually not been consistently measured throughout, throughout the whole years. So that's one way of looking for astrophysical neutrinos. But that one actually does have a caveat. And the caveat of this way of looking at it is that you know, if something really strange is going on with this unknown, unmeasured, and not well calculatable uh, component, maybe you, know, you will think that uh, in reality what you're seeing here is not really astrophysical neutrinos, but some strange particle physics that's making these D mesons produce more neutrinos. So this is dangerous. Uh, and the reason that this is a problem is that, like I was saying earlier, the prompt component and the astrophysical component have the same angular distribution. That means that your only way of distinguishing between them is the energy. So, some years ago, oops, people thought of a different idea of finding astrophysical neutrinos. As I was saying earlier, the uh, flux of uh, mions is gigantic. But one thing that we can do is we can take our detector and we can define what we call a fiducial region. So, I only going to keep events that start inside my detector. And anything that, you know, for example, like a like that comes in, it's going to put some light here. Anything that does that, I'm going to throw out. Um, the good thing about this is that most of the muons that come from the atmosphere are going to deposit light in this beta region and are going to be immediately taken out. So now I have to recover basically what, what we call all sky vision, which is good. Uh, but then there are going to be um, additional benefits for this. So if you go and take all of the events in Cube, and then you take all of the events that deposit, uh, let me just draw this diagram here again. So I have my detector. This is my fiducial region. This is my beta region. So I'm selecting all of the, I'm plotting all of, I'm plotting all of the events, and I'm plotting them as a function of two axes. One is the amount of charge uh, that this event deposited in the detector, so that's this and the amount of charge that is deposited inside of the beta region, so this region here. So you can see that uh, there is this very large population, 
of many of many events, but many of them deposit lost a large amount of light in the Zbito region. Now, when you zoom in and look at the events that deposit less than three photoelectrons uh, inside of the beta region, that's very so there's basically no no charge here. You see that this component sticks out. So these are events that somehow sneak through the beta region, um, basically uh, not, not not emitting any light, um, and deposit a very large amount of charge. And the only way you can do this is basically uh, by having a neutrino, because a neutrino, of course, will come in like that, it will make a giant blob here, and no charge here. So these events are qualitatively very different from the other background that's here, and these are astrophysical neutrinos. And this is the way we actually found the first uh, evidence of astrophysical neutrinos. It was not through the classic looking through the Earth channel, but it was actually using this beta technique. Uh, and this kind of event selection actually uh, has one of the highest energies neutrinos ever observed. So now we have this 10 PV one, but the first two that were observed were BERT and Ernie. And then a year later, we saw what we call Big Bird. And so BERT uh, is an event that has around one PV of energy, deposited inside of this future region, and then Ernie is a little more than one. Okay, so in, in really, for some reason, they were named after Muppets uh, characters, the first events that were found in these kind of searches. And I was told that, uh, for example, this one was named BERT because it has this long nose here, and this was not the earning because of this white direction. But you know, people stare at this event maybe too, maybe too long. Okay. So in the same event selection, and just to just to tell you that we are really seeing this astrophysical neutrino component, uh, you can find events like this one. And so this is a 400 TeV uh, neutrino event. Um, you can see it here. So you can see that there, this is actually a track, so a mu neutrino. Uh, the lack of basically uh, light in this part is just because of the dust layer we were talking about yesterday. Uh, but what I want to note is that this event is coming from this direction. Uh, and this event here in the top, uh, you see we actually, I mean, I'll talk about this uh, so far, but a cube is not only a, a neutrino detector here, but it also has a cosmic ray. Uh, detector array up here. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a collection of water tanks. And what's interesting is that if you look at the colors, remember the colors indicate time, this event and the heat of these water tanks are not in causal corre correlation. That means that this particular event uh, went through the ice stop detector, did not actually make an air sharing of, um, so an, air, an air shower there, and it deposits a huge amount of light in the detector without any actual light deposition on the, on the highest norms. So this by itself, you know, it's already a, a very significant evidence of astrophysical neutrino. So the so-called high energy starting events, and it's an acronym you will see many times, um, and it's basically this, this kind of event selection, um, observes, you know, these events here, and you can see them as a function of the energy that they deposit in the detector, and as a function of the declination that they have, uh, so the direction that they are of their arrival. So this part of the plot is the southern sky, and this part of the plot is the northern sky. These two events here are Bert and Ernie, so these are these PV events. Um, and you see that um, this part of the, sky, of the sky here, the northern sky is empty, so they have no PV events. And the region of that should be clear is, and the reason is that the Earth opacity is very effective here. So the events, the neutrinos cannot go to the planet in this part of the sky. Uh, so basically, as you measure the population of events in this direction, you're making a measurement of the, of the Earth density. So it is clear that these events here, because of the high energy that they have, have to be an astrophysical component. Uh, but the question is, events over here are in a regime where the atmospheric component is actually also very important. Uh, and because of that, it would be nice to be able to know how many of these are atmospheric or astrophysical. And so to be able to figure that out, we actually need to use the angular information of these events. And this is what I was telling you earlier, uh, that the different components are going to have different angular dependence. So here is a cube, this is this angle here. Uh, so if I have a, a downgoing event, a downgoing direction, the expected angular distribution of the conventional component here, the new and here, the new mu, is shown like that. 
Um, the prone component uh, is flat. Yeah. Again, the conventional component, um, mu on the contribution is larger than mu is. Uh, but as you can see, what's important here is that the angular distribution of the superficial component, and this one is quite, is quite different. This is actually not flat, like shown here. And the reason of the non-flatness is, again, because the earth absorbs something else here. But that's a, not, a, not a relevant detail in this plot. But the problem is that you, know, you could imagine that you could make, move this prone component up by a factor of 10 higher, and you could start be the same level as this one. And in the earlier, I want to say in the, somewhere around 2012, uh, somebody realized something really, really crucial. Um, and the, what they realized is that if you have an air shower, if an air shower produces a neutrino, it's also going to produce a muon. And in particular, this association is very close if uh, the muon is a muon type neutrino. So, um, okay. I'm not sure if that's clear, but let me just emphasize that in pictures because I'm going to run some, do some equations and maybe a little naughty. So, I have my beta region, my fusion part. Here is the atmosphere. Um, if I have an astrophysical neutrino, a truly astrophysical neutrino, that's of course going to come by itself. It's going to be just detected. If you have an atmospheric neutrino, that atmospheric neutrino must have been produced in some atmospheric shower. So in mind that this is a muon type neutrino, okay? So I see that here it interacts. And then this makes a mu. Uh, if that's the case, then I know that this was a new mu. It could have also been a new tau, but that's suppressed by the, by the branching fraction. And that means that this must have come with, for example, for a pion, and that must actually have come with a mu. Just because, you know, lepton number has to be conserved. So I can compute first this mu energy, right? And from that muon energy, I can infer my typical neutrino energy. This is the y distribution. That's around a factor of two. So then from that neutrino energy, now I can figure out what was the energy of this pion. Or let's say it was a pion. And given now that I know the energy of the pion, I can figure out the energy of the muon. And I can figure out what's the probability that this muon did not hit, uh, did not make light in this part of the detector. Um, now, that's in the case that you see uh, a muon attract here. If you see something that's not attract, so in mind that now I'm not in that case here. So now in mind I see a blob. So I see a cascade. So now in the case of a cascade, in mind that somehow I figure out my cascade direction. So I figured out that the neutrino was really coming from that. Okay. Know that that is already difficult because, uh, five minutes. Uh, so now that's already difficult because the cascade's resolution is around 10 degrees. So that's the stuff. But anyway, let's assume I figure this out. Um, so now I know that this is probably either, well, this, this is tricky. So if you have a cascade, it could have been any flavor neutral current, or it could have been mu e, uh, cc, or it could have been mu tau, uh, cc, but not in the tau decay mode. So that happens one minus branching fraction of the tau to mu ratio. Okay? Um, so, in this case, let's assume the worst case scenario. So I assume it's a new E. Okay. So if I assume it's a new E, now I know, I, I guess this is here, I have an electron. So now it's a little more tricky because, you know, in this case it was easy because I have this muon, and of course this muon will get to my detector. This electron will make an electromagnetic shower. Electromagnetic showers do not make it one kilometer deep. So I have a problem. So there is, though, when a cosmic ray shower happens at high energy, 
uh, this neutrino coming from some, let's say, a kaon, I can figure out that this kaon must have come from a proton plus air makes kaon plus things, right? So now I can figure out actually what the proton energy was, from which I can infer what other things must have existed. And so cosmic ray showers, like Johannes was saying in the morning, are very large events. So it's very strange that you have a shower that has no muons. So what you have to compute in this case is the probability uh, that none of the muons in this shower that corresponds to this primary particle actually get to this, this piece here. Um, so that computation is known as the, as the neutrino passing fractions. And so the passing fractions are basically the probability that all the accompanying muons in the cosmic ray shower happen to disappear before they actually get to the detector. So for the case of a muon neutrino, this calculation is very simple. Uh, for the case of shower events, so when you have a blob, this calculation is much more complicated. And so for reasons of time, I'm not going to go through it, but basically this calculation requires knowledge of, of course, the cosmic ray flux, how the cosmic rays makes air showers, how do muons actually go through the ice, and how does the detector you know, is able to figure out uh, if the muon was observed. So I'm just going to skip all of this. Let's keep all of these equations. Okay, so uh, we can shut that on the discussions if you guys are interested how you compute such a thing. But basically the important part <coughs> is that now my conventional component, which was like that, uh, is now suppressed. And the reason it's suppressed is that these neutrinos uh, that will have come at this level cannot make it through because the sibling muon will have activated this beta region. And this is really important because for a conventional component, I already had a handle, which was that this shape is different than this shape. But for the prone component, which had the same angular dependence as the physical component, now this, degener this degeneracy is broken. And you can see now that, you know, before I applied this condition, uh, my atmospheric neutrino flux at 100 TeV was higher than my astrophysical neutrino flux. After I apply this condition, uh, this suppression factor of the sibling muon brings all of the atmospheric components below the spectral astrophysical components. And that's great. Uh, you can only apply this trick for neutrinos that come from the uh, southern sky, right? Because, of course, for all the neutrinos that come from the northern sky, the sibling muon has died away. I mean, that was the whole benefit of the northern sky approach. It so happens that because the ice cube detector um, is, it's, 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 let's say, so good at rejecting things that are coming into it, that this technique is very effective. Um, so now if I plot the events that were observed uh, in this kind of event selection as a function of the direction of the events, um, uh, you can see data shown as crosses. Um, so the backgrounds here are shown as a stack histogram like that. And so you see that this stack histogram uh, is suppressed in this contribution. So basically, there is no way that you can increase your background shape to actually match your data, because the shape of your background is sort of like a pyramid shape, and your data is basically flat. Just give me five minutes. And, <laughs> um, and so basically, that is the reason why the astrophysical neutrino component uh, is a secondary reason why the neutrino component must exist. It's to explain the flatness of this distribution. Uh, okay, great. So you can make a fit of this data set, and you will get actually a different answer. You get that the astrophysical index that you obtain uh, using the Beto technique is somewhere around 2.9. So this number is very different, and it makes many people very concerned because this number is 2.7, and this number is 2.9. So you could think that maybe we have, we have done something wrong. But you know, maybe in this discussion we can talk more about it, and I will explain you why, why at least I don't think that's the case. Um, great. So then um, you can see here the summary of astrophysical neutrino measurements using all sky events. And this is the events for northern sky. Uh, this is a kind of pseudo unfolding, basically, I was talking yesterday, but this is the unfolded fluxes 
as a function of the neutrino energy. And you can see that the northern sky prefers this hard component. Uh, the old sky starting events have the softer component here. And the softer component is actually primarily driven uh, by these low energy events here that are too high. Uh, and it's sort of, you know, it, 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 it is hard to say what's going on in this region at the moment. Um, but basically, um, the, this is, this is a, well, this is an issue of current discussion. Okay, so I think that's a good point to stop. Uh, Actually, we have still three minutes, but uh, we, can no, go, we can get questions. Yeah, yeah. Time for questions. So, great. Yeah, Fabio wants well, three questions. Three questions. Yeah, we need three questions for lunch, so please. <laughs> so, can you gain any information about flavor oscillation from neutrinos? Given that you have a different flux and a different uh, view of the detector for each flavor. So let me repeat your question so I, to see if I get it. So you, how reliable is the flavor information of a physical neutrino given that the backgrounds are flavor dependent, the detection is flavor dependent too? It's a real question. Um, so. Currently, the determination of a surface energy of flavor is not very good. I will show that tomorrow in the morning. Uh, but I think that um, the flavor composition of your backgrounds, so the fact that the, the conventional component has a larger amount of new mu's and a, larger amount, a small amount of new e's only depends on you knowing the branching fractions of pions and kaons, and that we know very well. The flavor composition of the prong component, which comes from D mess on decay, is also well understood flavor-wise. So the background flavor composition is very well understood. Now, where you could stumble into a problem is when we do this thing here, which is when we happen to subtract the background in this flavor-dependent way. Um, the good thing is that we have looked at the uh, possible uncertainties that dominate this calculation, and as far as we understand it, those uncertainties are subliving on the measure astrophysical neutrino parameters. I do not know if we have done a study that's complete that at the same time changes the uncertainty of these calculations and we change also the assumed flavor composition. Most of the time, how we do our analysis, we assume we, all of the associated flavors are equal, and then we measure the spectral index. And with that assumption, we get this number or that number. Uh, and then under that same assumption, we also quantify these uncertainties. So one thing that we want to do next is, of course, you know, and that's a reasonable assumption because the data are small, but we want, want to combine them and we have to, re, I guess, revisit that question. But the only, the only weak point I could see is this point here. But we have studied this quite a lot, and this, the errors on, this, on these calculations are not that bad. More questions? We need Come two on, more. we need two more questions. It comes a recording, I cannot lie to Fabio. He will check it. Oh, we he will definitely questions. check it. Yeah, <laughs> we cannot escape. Guys. Okay. It's a short question, but uh, so Ice Cube Gen Two is is gonna be uh, ten kilometers, or in principle, right? Uh, and you mentioned at the beginning that uh, the muons they travel like a kilometer to ten kilometers. Do you expect to see any self-contained muon tracks inside of Ice Cube Gen 2? Um, oh, contained. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I mean, at lower energies, they will be contained, right? So if the muon is, as you go to your energy lower, uh, you will contain them. The question is if you will reconstruct them well. Uh, so this happens in Ice Cube at the moment too. So we, 
do also see contain muons that are below, let's say, 50 GeVs, but those are such a small fraction that we cannot really reconstruct them accurately. Uh, so I do not know how that interplay will go between making the detector sparser, right? Um, because, of course, as, as you lower the energy, you will eventually do contain the muon, but at, when you actually contain it, will you have an energy high enough and you will reconstruct it because Gen 2 may have a higher energy threshold. So that interplay, I don't know exactly. So good question. Hello. So, <laughs> so uh, uh, from the strong cosmic ray composition. Uh, Hello. Yeah. No, it's okay. mm. From different cosmic ray composition, do you like uh, you expect more uh, neutrino production for like for a heavy nuclei or for a, like for a proton? Like so if you consider same number of events or same number of cosmic rays for a proton? and for iron, so in which case the uh, neutrino production will be more and so on. So, uh, so I guess your question is, what's, how does the neutrino production depend on the cosmic recomposition? Yeah. So cosmic recomposition, um, so I will guess that, so it does depend, yeah. that, and we do take that into account. Mm -hmm. um, my guess is that when the composition is heavier, you have typically less energy per nucleon, yeah. right? And the energy per nucleon is what matters when you produce, you have hard processes. So my expectation is that as the composition gets harder, uh, say heavier, you will get a, so, a slightly softer spectrum. Okay. Is my is what I will guess. But actually, maybe no, I don't have it. Because, okay, so is it due to like uh, there are some other energy losses which are dominant for the heavier nuclei? No, 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 no. I think that what what matters here is what matters in that point is the interaction between the first. They say this is iron, right? That and, a, and an air molecule. So that that first interaction point is where that enters. Okay. It's not the energy loss of the of the cosmic ray in there. Okay. It's how does the first interaction because these neutrinos are the higher energy neutrinos of the atmospheric neutrino shower. Yeah. So the only place where they're going to be efficiently produced is either in the first interaction or the maybe couple of next inter interactions. So, yeah, the, the, that would be that would be dominated by this process. Okay. So the multiplicity of particles that comes from the uh, nucleon air collision is what matters, so not the energy loss. So for heavier nuclei, expectation is less for the production of neutrinos. It's what I, I, I will guess, but I will have to I will have to check. Yeah, that's what I will guess. Okay, more questions. No? Well, let's thanks to the speaker of the morning again and see you back at three. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I was going to try to speak.